Let us not forget one fundamental issue which lies at the heart of our problems. Over a period of years, persistent and growing global imbalances fueled a dramatic increase in capital flows, low interest rates, excessive risk taking, and a global search for return. These excesses cannot be attributed to any single nation. That, of course, was Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson speaking at a news conference during the great financial crisis all the way back in 2008. We're in a very different world today, but it's striking that we have once again enormous capital flows, low interest rates, what some say is excessive risk taking, and a global search for return. The Brookings Institution assembled a task force to look at financial stability today, and it issues its report this week. We are fortunate to have with us the co-chair of that task force. He is Glenn Hubbard of the Columbia Business School, together with Sarah Bloom Raskin who's looked at these issues both as a Federal Reserve governor and as a Deputy Treasury Secretary. So, first of all, congratulations on the report. Glenn, you got it out. Tell us what's different and what's the same, what you found from your report. Well, it was funny seeing that clip of Hank because it really could have been done, uh, could have been done today. I think what happened in the global financial crisis is we focused on banks, and we actually did a pretty reasonable job in dealing with banks. The problem is if you push on a financial system here, it comes out here, and the here is non-bank, Finance. And the way I think about it is, if you're thinking about fire, putting out a fire or fire prevention, one tool is just to put out fires after they're raging. That's the way regulators typically do it. That's what Hank was talking about. But another is to prevent the buildup of combustible materials in the first place. If I'm not torturing it, that's like policy. And in, another is to smell smoke, and that's process. And what we tried to do in the report was say, what are the key externalities, the spillovers, if you will, from one sector to the other in the economy, what kind of policies need to change in non-bank finance, and what is causing the regulatory process to miss things? Why did the Treasury market break down last March? What could we have done to make that better? We talked about housing uh, earlier. What could we be doing there? Is FSOC working? Those are the kind of questions we were doing on a, quote, clear day uh, <laughs> to see if we can make it better. So, Sarah, one of the things that strikes me about this is I don't know the policy, I don't know the regulation the way you and Glenn know it. At the same time, I've heard for some time now about issues with non-bank issues, not the banks, as Glenn says, they're regulated at this point, they've got a lot of reserves, and also short-term uh, uh, funding issues. I've heard about this quite a bit, and yet it seems, keeps coming up, including, as Glenn says, uh, just a little over a year ago now. Why don't we fix yeah. it? Right. So, um, you know, one of the virtues of the work that Glenn and his group did is to highlight uh, once again uh, some of the issues that are going on really outside the contours of banking as we understand banking. Now, the, 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 the rules and structures around the banking system are much more developed than they are in the than in the non-bank space. And as Glenn points out, you know, you can take all kinds of actions within the contours of the banking world, and there will be effects outside. And it is those outside effects that this report and this group are once again highlighting. And the question is, why are they once again highlighting this? And why were these issues not addressed fully earlier? And, uh, you know, so, so after the financial crisis, um, there was indeed quite a bit of attention put on the financial sector, but mostly the regulated part of the financial sector. What are called wholesale funding markets, the so-called plumbing behind a lot of the non-banking activity that, uh, you know, that, that, that Glenn and this report discuss, those issues are far less along in being addressed. And yet they have to be because they are the source of important parts of uh, important components of financial stability. And really to go much further without addressing these underlying risks is actually quite perilous. And one of the things that I, that I think is important in this discussion is that we have to understand that there that these are that this is the pipe right? right and you've got to keep your pipes clean right. you cannot clog them up right. and when you clog them up you actually create all kinds of problems well, and, and so and yeah the, and the good news here glenn is for those who, who haven't gotten a chance to look at the report you have a road map i mean you lay out a series of issues and, and including a series of recommendations about what can be done about it give us an example or two of things that should be done, and by the way, who would do them? Because I'm not sure about who the regulatory authority who would do it. Sure, well, let, let's start with the Treasury market because that was a real life stress test that we all failed in March of 2020. There's no market more fundamental 
to finance in the United States and around the world. The Fed had to buy one and a half trillion dollars in treasuries, more than it bought during the entire financial crisis in a short period of time. What had happened was the size of the treasury market had grown enormously from government debt issuance, but the capacity of private dealers to intermediate hadn't kept pace. Part of that was regulation, part of it other things in the economy. That was foreseeable. We could make steps to make those dealers more able, you know, modifying regulation a bit, having to do with liquidity ratios. We could also create a standing Fed facility where it's really clear you don't have to dump treasuries. Uh, another issue is um, money market funds and open end bond funds that had grown very large. To the extent in a crisis those funds try to dump their treasuries first, we may need to think about that. A lot of the financial sector in the non-bank world was creating liquidity or the illusion of liquidity. And the question is, is that liquidity really there? To and do these things, do you do need legislation or is there existing regulatory authority to accomplish some of that? It depends. Some of the things we recommend, particularly about process, existing regulatory authority can do. Uh, Secretary Yellen, in her capacity as the chair of FSOC, could make some of those changes. But some things we recommend, like giving each agency a financial stability mandate, that you'd have to go to Congress to do. Some of the housing things we talk about, you'd have to go to Congress to do. So, Sarah, you've spent a fair amount of time in Washington, uh, both in the executive branch and at the Fed. If it's this straightforward uh, and it's this important, why doesn't it get done? I think part of the reason it doesn't get done is because a lot of things in Washington are, are not done with a precautionary approach. They're done after the crisis has hit. And, um, you know, examples of, of, uh, of lawmaking, I think, are, are filled with this idea that, you know, we kind of wait till a disaster strikes and then we come in and clean up. Um, that actually is an approach that turns out to be quite costly. Um, it turns out to be an approach that, um, you know, I think uh, is, is quite suboptimal. Um, one of the very interesting kinds of risks facing financial stability right now, of course, is the, you know, risks posed by, by weather and climate related events. And that is a prime example of a kind of risk. And by the way, it's discussed in the report that that um, that Glenn is sharing here. And, you know, this idea that um, a, you know, a, a climate event that we need to actually wait um, for actual disaster to occur before legislating, I think is quite problematic. And so the, you know, the notion is we're going to, we have to change our habits. Congress, you know, really can't be waiting for actual meltdowns before stepping in and fixing things. So to the extent there yeah. are fixes that Congress should take, right. I say let them let, let, let Congress take them now. And then, yeah. by the way, there are also things that regulators can be yeah. doing right now that don't require yeah. legislation. And we shouldn't, you know, let the regulators off the hook for doing things now as well. Right. Glenn, yeah, one thing, thing the regulators can definitely do is look back and look forward. As Sarah was saying, you know, a lot of these trends are bubbling under the surface. And if we had a requirement that regulators do that, Congress would then put pressure. If you told Congress this area has exploded in importance, Congress would hold a regulator accountable. When I mentioned before about lack of a financial stability mandate, at present, other than the Fed, most of the regulators don't have that as an objective. So I, I think there are ways to focus Congress.